Hello again. Hi. Uh, my name is Cassie Lotman. Like I mentioned earlier, I work at Crisis Text Line, um, where you can volunteer or you can also come work, um, which is what I did. I became an um, employee of Crisis Text Line after being a volunteer. Before I did that, I worked for a startup called Ocuvera in Lincoln, Nebraska. It's a company that does fall prevention for hospitals um, and anywhere that there are high fall risk patients. Um, that fall prevention is done using a Kinect camera pointed at the bed that uses machine learning and computer vision to determine whether the patient's going to get out of bed before they actually try to do it and hurt themselves. Um, so the system is pretty complicated. There's a lot of moving parts. I didn't touch any of the complicated stuff, but I did get to do deployments, which is what I'm here to talk to you about today. I'm here to talk to you about Octopus Deploy, which is a deployment tool that is paid. I'm sorry, I'm not here to talk to you about open source, source tools that will save your companies tons of money. Um, but it's still a good tool, um, and I'm going to tell you why I think you should use it. Um, Octopus Deploy fits into your build pipeline as the thing that deploys what you have as a finished product. Build servers build, Octopus deploys. So in your product process, you'll write the code, you'll commit it to your build server, um, push it there, test it there. Um, you can set it up to automatically deploy to a first testing environment. Um, for example, at Ocuvera, we deployed to a test environment automatically every morning at 7 a.m. with whatever was on master. Um, then once we've tested it there and are ready to go to QA, you can promote it through the environments until finally you can push to prod with Octopus. As I mentioned, we had a pretty complicated setup at Ocuvera. Um, there were a lot of moving parts on the system. There was a Windows server that is the hub um, there was a connect and a computer in each room um, that was the brains of the operation. There was a Windows desktop app that um, did patient monitoring and alarms for nurses, and then we had Android and later iPhones that nurses carried to alert. And then, of course, we had a whole suite of monitoring tools we built that ran in, in Azure. In six months, we went from one deployment at a hospital with one of those hubs and a set of Kinect cameras to 15. And for a small startup, this is a big transition. Um, since each of our hospitals had to be completely isolated from every other hospital for patient protection reasons, every deployment was deploying a complete new copy of our system, um, what I'll talk about later as a tenanted deployment. So we use Octopus to help make this process really easy. Octopus is really good for .NET apps, but you can also use it for other types of apps, basically anything that you can package and need to run some set of predictable steps on some piece of hardware, you can use Octopus for. Um, it's primarily for Windows, but I believe you can run steps, you, you can run steps on Linux machines and run scripts and things like that. It's just Windows is their first class citizen. So let's get started. The first thing you'll do is install Octopus on a server. Octopus is the name of the software as well as the company. Um, you'll need your own SQL Server instance where you install it. Once you have completed that installation process, it's just a typical Windows installer, you'll see a nice window like this um, with this link up to localhost port 80 that is the web portal. Um, starting with Octopus, you will do most of what you need to do through the web UI. Later on, you can script it so that everything that you want to do with Octopus can be repeated, can be done by anyone who can push a button and run some code. Um, or you can do it through the web UI, which matches all the functionality that you can script and is a lot more user friendly, especially if you have people who don't write code who are handling some of your deployments, which you can do with Octopus. So to the web portal. Um, any of you with laptops might want to check out demo.octopusdeploy.com. That is a real live Octopus server that is running um, somewhere in the cloud that you can play around with as a guest user. Um, if you're thinking about Octopus Deploy for your company, I highly recommend checking out that site. Um, the first thing that you'll need to know about Octopus when you're getting it set up is that there are environments. There's a lot of different concepts and specialized vocabulary that goes with Octopus. I'm gonna give you the high level of what you'll need to know today while I'm talking. Um, an environment is a group of deployment targets. Some examples might be your dev environment, your staging, testing, production. 
Um, at one point, we thought that every customer, every tenant should be its own environment, and it was a lot harder to manage than grouping all of your production deployments together into one environment. When you've set up some environments, this is what the nice friendly web portal looks like. You can say I have a dev, test, and production environment with um, two machines, three machines, five machines um, that have their status reported on this page. Um, Octopus has tentacles. Um, there's tons of wordplay in Octopus. There's also another part of the system called Calamari. Um, Tentacle is the software that runs on your deployment target. It is also just a simple Windows installer that you run, and you have a lot of options of how you want to configure it. Do you want it to pull your Octopus server, or do you want your Octopus server to push updates to it? Do you want to use a proxy server to connect to your Octopus server? What port do you use? Does it need to be a non-standard port for any reason? Um, should it be part of a tenant, and what environment do you want it to be in? This is the um, page that you'll get to do all of that configuration. Um, you can walk through this GUI. You can see here, this is the last step, the install page. And I've already gone through welcome, storage, communication, and selected it to be a listening tentacle. That show script button is a really nice feature built into the installer. It takes whatever you have entered into the GUI and gives you the script for what does it look like to run all of that on the command line so that your next tentacle you install, you don't have to touch this GUI at all. It's all on the command line. So these are some sample scripts. Um, if you go to this link, which, are, which is on the slides um, that I've tweeted under the Erie DOC hashtag, um, you can see some modifications I've made to that. Um, those scripts, which make it even easier to run at the command line. But like I said, everything is out of the box right there. Um, you can see here um, something you'll need to set is server, your server name, which will be the same for all of your tentacles, um, the name of the, of the tentacle, and then the environment. Um, those are all things that you can script, and my updated script sets those um, via command line arguments. So now this is the environments page. We're looking at dev. Here are two tentacles, webapp01 and web02. Um, you can see that they are healthy. You can see that they have some tags. These tags um, help group the um, environments, or tentacles, so that you can deploy everything that's Phoenix Web at once if you want to. Um, you can use those ten tenant tags and, um, what are they? Deployment target tags um, pretty flexibly. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of vocabulary that goes along with Octopus. It's all jumbled. Um, this um, screenshot that I'm showing you now is from the previous version of Octopus. There was recently um, a pretty major update to the UI of the web interface. It didn't change a lot of the functionality, but it changed how you access a lot of that functionality. And the update, from what I've heard, has been a really big improvement. Before, when you wanted to manage accounts, you would go up to that environments tab, and then you'd go into accounts. And so every time you had to think, I need to change my Azure password in Octopus because I just changed it in Azure, um, you have to remember, oh yes, clearly I go to environment to think about accounts. Um, now it's grouped under infrastructure at that tab at the top and then accounts, and to me this seems like a lot more intuitive UI. Octopus focuses on listening to user support. They had a um, blog post outlining their process and roadmap for the year, uh, about a year or so ago, and they committed to do all of the user voice um, suggestions over some certain number of votes over their next year, and improve the UI was one of the top priorities. So this is the accounts page that you've heard so much about. Um, this is what it looked like in the old UI. You can see for a while you've been able to add Azure subscriptions, SSH key pairs, and username and passwords as first class citizens for use in your deployment steps. Um, now with the new UI, a new feature is also Amazon Web Services accounts. So if you're deploying to AWS, you also have built-in support in Octopus. A package in Octopus, 
is a chunk of stuff you're going to deploy. If you're in .NET world, it's probably a NuGet package. Um, if it's something else, it could be a collection of scripts in a zip file. Uh, it could be tar, um, all of your Java formats, um, because Java is something that they're really pushing. Also, um, Octopus wants to be in the Java deployment market. You have a lot of different options for getting your packages to Octopus. If there's something that you're already using as a continuous integration server, there's a pretty good chance that there is an Octopus extension for that continuous integration service. Um, if you already have one of those, definitely go that route. It's going to be way easier. You can also use the Octo EXE um, command line program. You can um, send an API request to your Octopus server to upload a package. You can do it through the web UI, but if you're doing that every deployment, then you're not using Octopus right. It's all about automation and making it so everything is repeatable, so there's the least amount of touch required for every deployment. It's more vocabulary words. In Octopus, we have projects, which is a set of steps and configuration variables that correspond to a deployment. You have a release, which is a set of packages and a point in time snapshot of your project. So what steps are going to run with this release might be different if you've added steps since that release was created. Uh, and you have life cycles, which is how a release gets promoted um, through different environments. So a life cycle might be from dev to, to test to staging to production. Um, there, that would be what they call a default life cycle. You can also have an override life cycle, which is go directly to this environment, don't pass any of the other environments because we don't care. Um, that's useful for hot fixes. At the beginning, um, at Occuvera, when we were using Octopus, whenever we would set up a new hospital, we thought that we should use the override lifecycle and deploy whatever the latest packages were to that new hospital um, using the override lifecycle. It was a terrible idea. Don't do that. Um, you should be deploying new tentacles with the latest packages that everyone else in that environment is using. So if you're deploying a new machine to prod, uh, seems like a no-brainer now with hindsight, but you should be deploying what's everywhere else on prod and not something that you might end up having to roll back later if you are ready to go live with that machine before those packages have made it through the life cycle. So I've promised you tenants. Here we have tenants. Um, a tenant is a project combination of a project and some tenant-specific variables. So in Octopus, you can have variables that are associated with the entire project, um, things that are common to every machine, or you can have variables that you can set for a specific tenant. So every machine, for example, might have a different password for the Windows services user. Um, and you can have a template to tell every tenant that gets connected to a project OK, you can be part of this project, but in order to deploy to this tenant part of this project, you have to fill in what is your Windows services password. So it's a really nice way of managing your configuration um, on a per deployment target basis. Now we're going to talk about deployment steps, which is the fun part. Um, all of that stuff before that we've talked about so far, you're going to set up once or once for each deployment target. Um, your deployment process might change a little bit more over time as you come up with more things that you want your deployment process to do. There are a lot of built-in step templates that you can use for Octopus. Um, this is just a sample of some of the built-in step templates. Um, there's things like run a PowerShell script um, on your machine, run it in Azure, send an email, send a notification to Slack saying that the deployment ran, uh, install a Windows service. There's also community step templates, which is a community contributed library set of all these different things. Um, pretty much anything that you could want to do with a deployment process probably already has an existing community step template for it. I found these step templates to be really high quality. Um, they generally had better error handling, better logging, better status reporting than the scripts that I was handwriting myself before I remembered, oh, I should go look to see if there's a community step template for this. 
Um, so definitely go look at the community step templates first before you try to write your own. When you're writing your own step, you can write it in C sharp, F sharp, um, Bash, I believe, um, and PowerShell. You have a lot of options for writing for the scripting language that you use, and the step will run on the machine you tell it to or on the Octopus server itself. So things like update something in Azure might run on the Octopus server to talk to Azure instead of go to the deployment target and do this. It's do this on the Octopus server on, beh on behalf of this deployment target. I have some examples here. This is drilled down into the Windows section of the community step templates. So you can see there's a lot of really good stuff here. Um, check your file permissions, create a shortcut, run a Windows installer, stop a service, certificates. Um, certificates are also first class citizens in Octopus. We'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the variable section. Um, but it's a really nice way to manage your certificates and everything you need to upgrade whatever you're deploying um, on your deployment targets. And here we are, variables. Speak of the devil. Um, variables are a really powerful feature in Octopus and one of the main advantages of using it over other tools. Their variable management system makes a lot of sense and you have a lot of flexibility over how you scope variables to determine where they apply. Like certain variables might apply to just your test environment and then there's a different um, variable for the same thing in your other environment. Um, you can define variable scope by environment, a target role, which is just a tag basically applied to a deployment target, um, a specific target, so say this machine in particular has something wrong with it that makes it have to use this particular variable value, um, or certain steps in your process, maybe you want to limit it to only one step that variable applies to, or a channel, um, which is a, a way that a release lifecycle can be grouped into channels. Um, the step uh, scoping in particular, I haven't found to be extremely useful. You might have use cases for it, um, especially if you have hundreds of variables that you're worried about clashes between them. Um, if you have hundreds of variables, though maybe Octopus isn't your guy. Um, I've used it with up to maybe 100, 150 variables, and that was a, a lot to manage. Um, Octopus did a pretty good job of managing all of those, but when you get to more than that, I think you'll want something that has a little better support for version controlling of your variables. Um, that's something that Octopus doesn't really excel at, is version control of variables and who changed what. Um, so the, the step scoping just to me seemed like clutter. Once you've created some variables, um, here's some examples of what it might look like on your variable list. This is again in the web UI. You have complete freedom to create variables, look at variables, um, edit var existing variables through those scripting tools that I've mentioned before. So up here we have database user password is a sensitive variable. Um, it has two different variables defined for that same variable name. One applies to production, and the other applies in the dev and testing scopes. Then we have OctoFX database, which is a composed variable um, using a templating system called OctoStash. Um, you might be familiar with, I think it's mustache.js. It's basically that, but for Octopus. Um, so here, server equals database server, stuff, stuff, stuff. Um, that's composing another variable called database server. And you can, do, you can have a lot of flexibility with that so that you're keeping your variables dry and making sure the updates get applied in the right places. And then finally, we have a certificate, which is actually a variable type. You upload your certificate file to Octopus and then can deploy it as part of a step um, you can tell the step template, okay, here's the certificate file that you're going to install. I mentioned Octostash. Um, this is a little sample program that I wrote using Octostash. It's available as an open source NuGet package. Um, so you can 
play with it if you want to test out how is this going to resolve. Um, this is also um, a, a demonstration of what you can do with it. There's not a ton of filters, but there are some. Like here I'm using two lower um, applied on the variable site and putting that into a new variable. So you might want to import your variables if you have those 100 variables from something that you're going to switch over to start deploying with Octopus. Um, you're going to either write a script yourself um, to upload them via the API, or you're going to do them all by hand. Um, when we did a big refactor of how we were using Octopus and how we had configured our organi organizations and environments and all of that, um, I ended up exporting them by hand to an Excel spreadsheet so that I could reorganize them there and then importing them back in different orders and um, in the different types of variables that you can have in Octopus. And it was not the funnest time of my life. Um, <laughs> so importing variables is another thing that is supposed to be on the Octopus roadmap. But in this case, it has been for years, and there hasn't been any movement on it, so don't get too hopeful. Um, but that is, um, again, one of those opportunities where you have the Octopus API at your disposal, and if you put the time into it, you can write something that will do all of this importing and exporting for you. So now that you have some machines, you have them assigned to environments, you have some steps, and you have a release with the created with the packages that you've pushed, you probably want to deploy that release. You have a nice uh, deployment page where you'll pick out um, what machines to target. Um, and you can do that targeting um, very similarly to how you defined variable scopes. Do you want it to be um, only machines in this role, or do you want it to be tenants with a certain tag, like production group A, or um, acceptance testing group B or something like that. Um, then you can flag which steps you want to run. Sometimes you want all the steps to run, um, but sometimes you want to skip a particular step because it's not working right or you know it will fail on that machine. Um, you want to try to avoid having to manually flip steps, obviously, so that every deployment is repeatable. But you can always go back and look at exactly what things ran for a particular deployment what steps were skipped, what was the log outputs for that step. Um, one application that I found very frequently with turning steps on and off was when I was setting up a new machine and had never deployed to it before, making sure that I had gone through all of the manual steps on that machine before I had all of those manual steps as octopus steps was a very hit or miss process. And if I kept on notify Slack of the deployment progress and send an email to the whole team with whether that machine was deployed correctly, um, I got very embarrassed. And so I would turn those steps off while I was doing my initial deployment. Um, init eventually, I got to a point with having enough of the manual steps in Octopus as steps that I had configured to run the same way every time that I didn't have to do that anymore and was able to deploy once to a machine and not have 10 failures first because I had forgotten a step about setting user B's account permissions to allow it to install a service. So here on the screen, um, you can see this is um, a little of the old UI. It might look just a little bit different now, but it shows you what steps have run um, and whether they were successful. They'll, they'll turn red if they failed. You can have steps like wait for user authorization. So if you want to run and do a bunch of things and then wait till a button is clicked by someone manually intervening and saying, OK, now you can deploy. We have notified support that this is happening now. You can do that. Um, and then once this is all green, um, you have that little button up there that's green that says promote to acceptance. That's where you'll take this release that's just been deployed to whatever environment was before, and you can promote it to the next thing. So you know you're, you're tracking the same thing through the environments. So let's talk about version control. 
because you're doing all this work of making your deployments repeatable, making sure that you have a process that will be the same everywhere for every machine every time. So you probably want version control, right, to know what ran when. Well, tough. Uh, there's some things you can do with Octopus, like saving your step scripts um, in GitHub, but that's so or in Git, perhaps using GitHub, maybe using something else. Um, but that's something that you're going to have to manage manually yourself. It's not something that Octopus will do for you. Uh, you can export your variables using the API, like I mentioned before, or using an Excel spreadsheet, which I had to do by hand at one point, but I do not recommend to anyone. Uh, you can see, um, ex export a copy of your entire SQL database, which is your backup of the entire Octopus server. So you can restore from those database backups, but that will, if you, if you restore from one of those backups, you lose all, everything that's been changed since then. So that's not really exactly what version control is supposed to be. So there's, there's some options, and you can version control little pieces of Octopus, but definitely not everything that you would want. This is also something that's on Octopus's radar. They have a request for comment out. It was posted six months to a year ago, um, where they put forth their ideas to the community and said, OK, this is what we're thinking. What do you guys think? Would this meet your use cases for version control? And the answers were kind of like, mm, maybe. So it's, it's something they're still working on that they know is a problem, but isn't there yet. Um, I have found that Octopus support and the, the support community on their website is a really good place to go for help with how should I do this thing with Octopus. Um, there's not a huge Stack Overflow presence for Octopus Deploy. Their support forums and the user voice forums are the two places to go for help with Octopus. Or you can tweet at me because I love thinking about Octopus and don't get to do it for my job anymore. <laughs> so what's the point of all this? I'm here because I recommend using Octopus to deploy .NET apps. Um, I would guess that it's pretty good for Java apps too, because I know they've done a lot of work on that. But I have experience with .NET apps, and if I had to do another one, I would definitely say, use Octopus Deploy. It will make your life easier. Now that we have our process set up at Occuvera, um, the people who are doing deployments there don't have to think about it anymore. They push the button, and it just goes. Um, I talked to former coworkers just last week, and he said that they're actually handing off responsibilities for the deployment process to a product manager who is not a coder or doesn't want to do any code. And I, th I think he'll be able to do it just fine with Octopus. You, the reasons you should deploy .NET apps with Octopus are because you can script as much or as little of you as you want of the deployment process. If you want to write lots of scripts to automate absolutely everything you ever touch, you can do it. And the scripting libraries that they have for Octopus are actually pretty um, well documented and easy to use. But if you don't want to do any of that scripting, you don't have to. Everything's available through the, through the GUI. There's a lot of built-in community step templates, so you're probably not going to have to reinvent the wheel and write a lot of PowerShell about how to do stuff, um, which is also something to remember if you start using Octopus. Look at the community step templates first. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Um, I don't know if any of you write a lot of PowerShell, but it's kind of difficult and is a, a beast unto itself. If you don't have to write PowerShell because someone's already done it for you really well with exposed code that you can look at before you run it, do that. Um, it's easy enough to get started using. Um, there is a 45-day free trial, I believe, um, where you can test it out. And if you're using it for a nonprofit or personal project, I believe you can use it indefinitely for free. Um, but it is powerful enough that if you have a really large use case for what you're deploying and you need that high availability, Octopus can provide it. And finally, the support has been very responsive. Um, the times that I've complained on Twitter about Octopus Deploy, as you do, I've gotten calls from a support engineer to set up a meeting the next day where we talked over the phone even though they were in Australia and I was in Nebraska. 
um, and they were able to help me with my issue, find a workaround, um, and actually talk to me about how the problem I was experiencing was on their roadmap and where it was on their roadmap. So even though it eventually got pushed back a little bit, I felt like I was being heard as a user and from a vendor, that's definitely something that I would look for. Um, so this is about all I have. Does anyone have any questions that I can answer about Octopus Deploy? Or Crisis Text Line, because I didn't get to talk about or take questions from then, and I have so much to say about Crisis Text Line, too. Yeah. Uh, um, so what they ask is a 200-hour commitment um, that they hope you do in a year. That breaks down to about four hours a week. Um, but you can do that in two-hour increments over a bit of longer period, whatever works for you. Yeah. People who care about other people um, and are willing to be patient sometimes with people who are really struggling and not necessarily presenting their best self. Um, because you have people that might be really angry with you, that might want something that you can't provide, and you still have to be professional and understanding and try to give them what they need or some form of it anyways. Yeah. Uh, thanks for both of your talks. Um, about the crisis text line, um, what is the escalation path? Like, if they use the texting of someone and sort of escalates, what, like, what are the right steps? Sure. So we're able to de-escalate, I want to say, over 99% of our conversations um, so that they don't turn into any further actions. Um, since I do a lot of late night shifts, often the de-escalation plan is um, you want to find a strategy that they can go to next. So what, what's your next thing that you're going to do that's going to help you? And late at night, it's sleep. What if you just tried going to sleep? And often they're like, you know what, I hadn't really thought of that, but I guess we'll try it. Um, if uh, there's a situation that can't be de-escalated, the texter can't find a way um, to plan for their own safety for that night. Um, you work with your supervisor who can give you guidance on what kind of questions to ask um, and help you um, make, they will do the escalation for you basically. Uh, a volunteer crisis counselor is never going to have to try to call a service provider in that texter's location. Um, the volunteer crisis counselor will never see their phone number or their location anyways. Um, so it's, it's all handled by the supervisor. You don't always know what the outcome of that call is, um, and that can be tough sometimes, but you just kind of have to trust the process that hopefully someone was able to find them and they got help. Yeah, go for it. What is your Um, I have a cat, and I snuggle my cat. <laughs> and I've got a boyfriend, and I snuggle my boyfriend. Um, but in the past, I've turned to um, kind of what you might call spiritual practices, though I don't think of it that way. I'll light a candle or some incense and think through the, the people that I've talked to that night. Um, often they'll, they'll tell you their name, and so I try to remember, okay, Joe, Bob, Sue, Shaniqua. And then um, just kind of let it go from there. You know, these are my people. I hold them in my heart, but it's gone now. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. <laughs>